Testament lesson is in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations, part of the third chapter. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not knowing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and chasten, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. He who conquers I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here ends the reading of the New Testament lesson. Now, because it's uh, July and things are a little less formal in the summer, and because I've been at least mildly inspired by Diana Ross showing that she can do everything herself, the sermon this morning is going to take place on the piano bench down there, so I'll see you in just one second. <laughs> I confess I'm a little nervous about this. <laughs> If you can't hear me in the balcony, will you just raise a hand? Now, it is certain that uh, life is like music in that we have to compose it, each of us. And by ear, by instinct, by feeling, not by rules alone, not by mind alone. But some people think life is very much like a uh, dominant seventh which can be very easy, easily resolved into the tonic. But those of us who know a little more about life know that life is really a diminished sound. For instance, take a C sharp, and you add to it an E, and a G, and a B flat. That's life. <laughs> Now, why is that life? Because that diminished chord can resolve into D major. Or that diminished chord can resolve into D minor. Or into A flat major in the sixth position. Or into B flat major in the sixth position. Or into F major in the sixth four position. I confess I'm showing off, Master. <laughs> But it is precisely because life is so complex and so rich and it has such heights and such depths and because it's so important that we feel what we think. Everybody says all men and women are created equal, but how many feel the monstrosity of inequality? and how qualitatively different that truth is. So music helps us to feel what we really believe and do we believe until we really feel. So that's why music is so important to religious life. All the arts are important. Who knows how much those of us who come here regularly every Sunday received simply from the beauty of these stained glass windows. 
or from the scores of figures in the altar screen. Probably most of us don't even know that the carvings on the pulpit were made from only two stones. And probably even the choir members don't know that at least some small part of their inspiration comes from the fact that underneath every one of their seats is a different carved figure. When you come up at the end of the service to listen to John Walker, if you're so minded, lift one of these choir stalls and you'll see what I'm talking about. Architecture, too, is important. Sitting out there, you can let your eye come forward here into the chancel. And in every church, you see the same thing. You see the lectern, where the Word of God normally is read. You see the pulpit, where the Word of God hopefully is preached. You see the altar, where the Word of God is broken, and the cross, where the Word of God is given. But today, let's think most of all about the music and most of all about the hymns, particularly the hymns uh, that we've sung. But before we turn to that first one, I just want to share with you what I think is the best real tight mix of music and words in any single hymn. And unfortunately, it's not in our hymn book. It's a setting of the 130th Psalm by, I think, Bach. Out of the depths have I cried, O Lord. And in German, it's Aus tiefer Not schrei ich zu dir. Out of deep need I cry to thee. And it starts with already a note of anguish. A seventh. Out, and then the depths with an open fifth. And then for need, a half note. And then cry. Two. Now listen to how we resolve this when it comes to the Lord. Suddenly a major. Everything is resolved in one phrase. Aus tiefer Not hard to find a richer mix, I think, of uh, music and words. But let's take the first hymn, if you will take your hymn books. It's uh, number 19, Land Fair. It says on the right, and the deer knows what that means, except that it's Welsh. <laughs> and then you see those metric numbers, 7777. Seven, seven, seven. That means any hymn that has uh, those... Um, Beats could be put to it. For instance, uh, you could you could do Jesus Christ is risen today, Hallelujah, because that's also seven 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 seven. But over on the right, on the left, you see it's based on Psalm 150. Well, I would say it's based on the spirit, perhaps a little more than the letter of Psalm 150. The Frank anthem, which will be the next anthem, is certainly based on the letter as well as the spirit of Psalm 50. But it was written by Henry Francis Light, 1793-1847. Now, Francis Light was a Scot born uh, in real poverty, orphaned at a very early age, but through a series of breaks, managed to get himself through Dublin uh, College and became an Anglican priest. And after a few short years in other parishes, he spent 27 years in Brixham Harbor in Devonshire. Now, most of you know Brixham Harbor is where uh, William of Orange landed in 1688 uh, when he came to help the Parliament of England get rid of Roman Catholic James II. Those of you who don't know that, I just throw it in. A little extra information. <laughs> now, here we have a hymn of praise. And it's a very typical hymn of praise. All the first hymns are hymns of praise. And it's right that the whole choir should come symbolically streaming forward to the lectern, the pulpit, the altar, and particularly toward the cross. 
And the hymns of praise, I say, are always joyful. They're always apt to be 4-4, four, 2-4 four, four time, a rigorous beat. They move right along. And they're almost always in a major key. Uh, once to every man and nation. There are few in the minor. But most of them are in the major. And notice how the rise of the melody really helps the notion of praise. It would be pretty hard to write, praise God's glory, glory, show, something like that. Wouldn't make any sense. But it makes a lot of sense to make it go up. And then the second line, same thing. And the third line, a little bit more. That's typical. Praise would go up, but it doesn't always have to go up. For instance, now you couldn't sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come, because the Lord comes from above. And therefore, it's wonderful that you have a whole octave. He comes all the way down. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Now, what is earth supposed to do if not rise? Let earth receive her king. Beautiful, right? And then later, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sound. You know but that's Christmas. I don't want to get distracted. <laughs> Getting back to uh, Mr. Light. It is interesting that he is known for two other hymns. We've looked at 19, but go back to 16, an even more familiar one. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, based on Psalm, as you see on the upper left, 103. There's Henry Francis Light again. And uh, that's a very well-known song of praise. He also uh, is probably best known for a very different hymn which he wrote, and that is um, hymn number 209, Abide With Me. And as we never get a chance to sing uh, Abide With Me in a morning service, uh, I'm going to suggest we sing two verses of it. Now, you'll, now you can understand why, I'm gonna, why I mentioned Brixham Harbor. In 1847, the Reverend Light was very ill. And uh, after service one Sunday, in fact, after tea one Sunday afternoon, he took himself down to a rock just above Brixham Harbor and looking out over towards Cherbourg. And as the sun went down behind him and the evening light began to steal across the waters, he wrote this song. It's about the end of the day, but it's all about the end of life. And within a very few weeks, he died. Now, the musician who composed it, uh, William H. Monk, Dr. Monk, it is said, when he read this, composed music for it in 10 minutes. And it's probably one of the most beautiful, pietistic 19th century hymns I think there are. So why don't we sing the first verse and then, John, if you would come in, particularly on the fifth verse, where it goes from the death to the triumph uh, of death, because you have to have some crescendo, I think, in there, which only the organ can supply. All right, let's all sing the uh, ver first verse of 209. Crescendoing, remember to observe all the commas.
If I may uh, speak very briefly, personally, for a moment. When uh, Alexander, my son, died in January, his mother and I, and I see she's here this morning, uh, sang this at the second funeral in Vermont. And then when everybody had left, and I was in this little village, I knew I had to do one day of solid, solid grieving. So I called a professor friend of English at Yale, and I asked him to give me all the poems, which I got. And then I went to this little church on the green and this rickety old organ, and I just sang this hymn over and over and over again. Uh, it's a wonderful way to do grief work, if I recommend that to you. There are lots of other hymns, but that one does uh, more than anything else, I think. All right, well, now let's turn to, uh, let's leave Mr. Light and turn to the second hymn, which is very different. That's hymn number 314. Now, the second hymn is apt to be less uh, roisterous, less uh, forceful. It's more interior-oriented. It's apt to be a sort of prayer hymn. Uh, last Sunday, you may remember, we sang, uh, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart very much of a prayer hymn. And uh, this one is very much like that. And uh, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, don't ask me again what's in the right-hand corner, I don't understand these things. Uh, but in the left-hand corner, you see Synesius of Cyrene, who lived 375 to 430. Now, Cyrene was a Greek uh, colony in northern Africa. Uh, those of you who remember World War II may remember the fighting around Tobruk. That's right next to Cyrene. And uh, those of you who remember the Gospel of Matthew in the 27th chapter when Jesus is going to be crucified, and they called a man Simon from Cyrene. But Cyrene by then had sort of passed its apex as a great cultural trade center, and the bishop, he was actually a bishop, this science, Cyrenius, um, Cynesius, uh, was a bishop who lived in the uh, 5th century, a very learned man, and apparently a very wonderful one, but by the end of his life, he had, he had come to all kinds of uh, tragedy. His beloved wife had died, his sons had been carried off by the scourge, notice the date, which means that the Western Empire is tottering. And so one can see a lot of his own personal grief, perhaps, in the second verse. Lord Jesus, think on me amid the battle strife. In all my pain and misery, be thou my health and life. Um, so his only recourse was really to throw himself uh, on Jesus. And it's a very simple, lovely, straightforward tune, and properly in the minor key. But uh, you may have noticed that... Uh, when Maestro Walker was playing the last verse, which is a triumphant verse about the life to come, and I, I may the eternal brightness see, he ended it, and share thy joy at last. He made it E major, which is very proper if suddenly you're going to talk about uh, life after death. Well, it's what's very moving about that hymn, I think, is that it was written 1,500 years ago. And in another language, you can feel the translation. Not that good. Uh, but it could still be as contemporary as it is, translated and 1,500 years later. That's pretty wonderful. All right. Let's finally turn to the last hymn, which we will sing uh, in just a bit. 329. O oh, Jesus, thou art standing outside the fast closed door. When I, uh, John Walker picks all the hymns, and that's why they're so good, and because he's theologically as sound as any uh, theologian I know, uh, I just let my sermons follow his hymns and not the other way around. <laughs> but I was surprised when I saw, Oh Jesus, Thou Art Standing, because that's not the usual forceful recessional which says, Go labor on, or go forth, or oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. You know, a vigorous beat. Uh, no, it's a very kind of interior-oriented again. So I called him up, 
I said, why'd you pick, uh, oh, Jesus, thou art standing as a recession? And he said, yeah, I was wondering that myself, but it's a very evangelistic hymn, and it represents a response to the gospel call. You can see at the bottom of the page, gospel call and response. And <laughs> And of course, the last verse, it's very right. Dear Savior, enter and leave us nevermore. As the point of all hymns is to become, in fact, what we are in song, it really is a very appropriate uh, last hymn. Now, it's written by another bishop. We're featuring bishops, uh, I know, uh, this morning. Only this one's an Anglican bishop. You see up on the right, William, uh, William W. Howe, William Walsham Howe. He was a bishop of Wakefield and apparently a very progressive bishop. He took on Darwinism and went right with it and separated religion from science as Tennyson had done. But Tennyson did it as a layman, no skin off his back. But for a bishop to do that, that was uh, pretty rough. He also was a very big-hearted man, a suffragan bishop of London, he was called a bishop of the poor, or he was called the omnibus bishop because he didn't ride around in a carriage. He rode around in a bus pulled by horses, uh, of course. But this one, um, he wrote another very famous hymn too, just to get him complete. And if you go back a few pages, it's 306 for all the saints who from their labors rest. And the one, there are two tunes for this. The one 306 is written by Vaughan Williams, a great modern British composer, you know. And the one on the other side is a real 19th century tune. And you can see the similarity between this one and Oh Jesus Thou Art Standing. I think it's a very fine one, but I'll show you what I mean by that. For all the saints who from their labors, there are a lot of unresolved first notes. Last and it's still not resolved. We're still on a seventh, you see. Who thee by faith before the world confess. And here comes another one now. Thy name, O oh Jesus. And another one. Be forever blessed. And another one. Alleluia. Alleluia. Now, if you turn to O oh Jesus, thou art standing, 329. You'll see you get these same kind of lush 19th century unresolved chords. Jesus, thou art standing outside the fast closed door. You'd never get all of those in box time, nor would Bun Williams ever write anything like that. But it works very well. Look, take the second line. In lowly patience, wait. And then at the end, oh shame, cry shame upon us to keep him standing there. Uh, I think that's a very beautiful uh, hymn. And it's nice that a bishop who intellectually was so progressive and morally so sensitive to the needs of the poor could also be so deeply reflective and write such a prayer hymn in such a wonderful evangelistic uh, way. Now the text obviously comes from Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, which we heard earlier. And it may have been inspired also by Holman's Hunt's famous picture. Some of you may have seen, um, what's it called? Light of the World, which was painted in 1854. And as this hymn was written in 1857, it may well have been inspired by a painting. And that's rather typical. It's inspired by a Bible. Bishop Howe says it was inspired by a poem. And it may be that it was also inspired by a painting. But it brings everything together, I think, in, uh, in a wonderful hymn. And uh, let me just stop there with a reminder the reason we sing these hymns is so that we can be, in fact, uh, what we are in song.
And early this morning, I was reading a poem of Pablo Neruda. And I think uh, he says very well what the result of every service ought to be, particularly if we've really been singing the hymns. Let us think of the entire earth and pound the table with love.